So before we dive into our content today, I just wanted to give you a quick overview about PSRC's Toolbox series. This is a quarterly webinar series that is focused on sharing best practices and resources for local planners. The idea is allowing you to learn from other planners and hopefully giving you another tool in your toolbox. Once again, my name is Katie Enders, and if you have any questions, comments, ideas for future sessions, you can reach out to me. A few logistics about today's session. The meeting is being recorded and we will upload that recording to our website. The presenters' presentations will also be shared both through email if you've registered for the webinar and they'll also be uploaded to our website. Um, you'll notice that this is a Zoom webinar, so you do not have the chat function, but if you have questions for our presenters, you should be able to enter them in the Q&A box. So feel free to use that. We do have some time at the end for questions, and as time permits, we'll have panelists answering questions, um, hopefully at the end of their presentations. If you are an AICP planner and you're looking for credits, we do have one available if you're completing today's session with us live. So I'll have that information for you at the end of the session. And finally, we just have a quick evaluation and a Title VI survey. Um, so if you don't mind sticking around for a minute or two after the session, we would appreciate it if you'd take the time to fill that out. I also wanted to mention we have another um, webinar coming up on November 1st. So this is kind of, a, they're not specifically related, but we wanted to do two sessions that were tangentially related to transit-oriented development. So we have today's session and then also a commercial displacement prevention, especially related to commercial displacement um, brought on by transit investment. So we have a registration link, which you can go on our website and find more information there. And when we post this slideshow after the webinar, you could also use that link. Finally, moving to today's very exciting topic, we have three great speakers lined up. Um, so after my welcome is over, I'll briefly pass to my colleague Liz underwood boltman and she'll give a topic introduction. We have Sarah Cho from the city of Linwood here to talk, followed by Anna Sengupta, who's here from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council um, in the Boston region. Finally, we will have Katie Ricuto from the U District Partnership here to share about their work. And then we'll be wrapping up with that Q&A. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and ask Liz to come talk with you about today's session. Good morning. Um, thanks, Katie, and thanks everyone for being able to join us today. So we've been doing an annual series on uh, equitable TOD. So we've done various events and webinars over the years. Uh, previous events have focused more on development opportunities, transit access, downtown recovery, things like that. Um, but today we thought it would be really nice to focus more on people and community development. So uh, we have folks here today to talk more about um, parks in the public realm, talk about activation, talk about the role of creative community development. So thinking about kind of the community development side of equitable TOD. So uh, we're really excited to have you with us and we're excited to have Sarah from the city of Linwood speak with us next. So I'm going to pass it to Sarah. Thanks, Liz. And uh, I want to say thank you to the PSRC for inviting Linwood to come back and present uh, for this webinar. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And it should be sharing now. Okay. Looks great. Perfect. Um, so uh, once again, my name is Sarah Cho. I am with the city of Linwood in Snohomish County. I am the city center program manager in our economic development team. And uh, most of my projects uh, are centered around our city center slash downtown core. Um, so in our presentation today, uh, I'm just gonna give a brief update on what's currently going on in Linwood. What are some of the projects we're working on and what we're uh, working on for the future. So to just give a little bit of context, um, the city of Linwood um, is, we do have a regional growth center and the regional growth center is a term that comes from the Puget Sound uh, Regional Council's regional growth strategy. Um, a regional growth center is a mixed use center that is formally designated by PSRC um, that includes housing, employment, retail, and entertainment uses. Uh, the regional growth centers are also focused on being pedestrian friendly and are being well served by transit. 
And these centers typically have an important regional role with existing jobs and housing, high quality transit service, and planning for significant growth. Uh, these centers also represent areas where there are typically major investments, such as high capacity transit, and offer new opportunities for growth. Uh, so in the city of Linwood, uh, our regional growth center includes our city center, uh, which includes our uh, light rail station that just opened on August 30th, um, and it will also include a second station uh, near the Alderwood Mall area. Um, speaking a little bit more about the Regional Growth Center, I briefly mentioned City Center and uh, Alderwood. Uh, for those that are unfamiliar with the Linwood area, uh, the Alderwood area is where we have our Alderwood Mall. It's a very big retail hub in Snohomish County. Um, so this, uh, the City Center and Alderwood sub area plan is focused on creating a cohesive plan in response to the changes that are happening in the region and in our city. Um, we're using the city center and Alderwood plan in preparation for the second light rail station, the Everett Link extension that will be um, adjacent to the Alderwood Mall, um, and also creating opportunities for employment and housing. Uh, within the next 20 years, this area will have uh, two light rail stations, and it is expected to support several new residential units and jobs, and planning is needed to determine how the quality of life can be improved and maintained in this area. I briefly mentioned that we just had our uh, first light rail station open on August 30th, so just a few weeks ago. Uh, we opened uh, and had a big party on the 30th, and you can see in the photos, this was for the ribbon cutting and our uh, night market that occurred on the same day. And the reason I really wanted to highlight um, this, these photos is really showing that the station itself, while it is being used to service transit, it's also being activated as a public amenity. Um, we had easily thousands of people come out for that night market and it was a giant essentially almost farmer's market uh, a big party so i think we're going to see a lot more of these types of spaces um, being used for events you can also see in the photo that we have this hummingbird um, art sculpture that is included at our station uh, this is just one of many artistic elements that were included at the uh, linwood transit center it was done by an artist uh, named Claudia Fitch, and the um, the art piece ex itself is a nod to the restored wetlands near the station and a celebration of the history of neon road signs along Highway 99. Um, so including these little items throughout the station um, really brought the whole station together. Um, in addition to the light rail service, uh, Linwood ha also has the Swift Orange Line uh, bus rapid transit service that is serviced through community transit. This Swift Orange Line opened in March of 2024, and it is community transit's third uh, bus rapid transit service line, which will provide fast frequent service linking Edmonds College, Alderwood Mall, and Mill Creek with connections to the Link Light Rail in Linwood. I also briefly wanted to include uh, from a tourism perspective, um, how our city has used the opening of light rail to take advantage of our visitors, our tourists, and even our residents. Um, so our tourism department um, is currently working on a campaign where they want to create awareness and generate excitement and educate the general population and new visitors of uh, what you can do in Linwood and how you can get to Linwood. Um, this uh, marketing, uh, program will highlight Linwood's incredible location and access to the greater Puget Sound. And through this program, we are hoping to create and develop uh, digital video advertising uh, campaigns using custom videos uh, through a point of view lens of using the light rail to get to Linwood, checking out our restaurants, checking out our hotels, um, checking out our Linwood event center. And we're really hoping to capture our target audience of group tour operators, meeting planners, and visitor audiences. Um, I think most of the time when people think of Linwood, they don't think of it as a tourist destination. Um, so we're trying to change that narrative. Uh, Linwood has over 13 hotels, um, I believe, which is the most hotels either in the county or in the general area. Um, so we're really trying to highlight and emphasize the assets that we have from a tourist perspective and um, get some uh, heads and beds. 
Uh, this slide here, I know there's a lot of information that's showing on this major projects map, um, but this is just a snippet of some of the projects that the city is currently working on uh, throughout the city center and Alderwood Mall area. Uh, these are all the public projects that the city is currently working on, and I'll, I will go into a little bit more detail on several of these items, but this just gives you a good idea of all of the investment that the city is currently um, putting on in this area. Oops. This map that we have here, this is also showing a list of all of our major private investments. So all of our multifamily retail development that's happening uh, throughout Linwood. And you can see that um, all of these new uh, development projects have just recently been coming down the pipeline. Um, so most of these buildings are only several years old or they're still um, under construction. And I'll also briefly mention some of these uh, projects in the next couple of slides as well. So one of the major private investment projects is Northline Village. This is definitely one of the biggest redevelopment projects that will happen in the city of Linwood. Uh, Northline Village is a little over 19 acre site plan that's right in the middle of city center. And you can see with some of the bullet points, th these are some of the goals that the redevelopment project is trying to achieve. Uh, they are trying to add an additional uh, 1300 residential units at over 500,000 square feet of office space a little over 200,000 square feet of retail space, 50,000 square feet of entertainment space, and uh, really create a grid street and add two additional parks in the city. And this was all developed through a development agreement that was approved by our city council back in 2019. Uh, these are just renderings of what the site could potentially look like. Currently, the site is um, housing some old retail structures. We have a, like a spirit Halloween coming in um, using some of their spaces, um, but it's giantly a, essentially a giant parking lot with some existing retail. And they're currently uh, doing all of the undergrounding work to get this project to fruition. And um, we'll hopefully see this break ground um, in the next couple of years. Um, another project that was recently opened in Linwood, um, it opened in June of 2022, is the Connect Apartments, which is um, right in city center. Uh, the Connect Apartments had 239 units and 20% of their units were income restricted uh, utilizing our multifamily tax exemption program that is offered in city center. They also took advantage of our transportation impact fee exemption and this property has 1.2 stalls per unit. And I'll show you why that's important as we uh, share some of the other projects. But this was one of the first apartments adjacent to the light rail station that really kick-started a lot of the other development in the area. Um, so you, once this building came up, I think it kind of not urged other developers to see uh, what the development potentials were in city center. And this was also our very first a uh, multifamily tax exemption applicant in the city of Linwood. Ember Apartments is another uh, property in city center that has just recently opened. They opened in June of 2024, a little bit build bigger than Connect. They have 361 units, also utilizing the MFTE program uh, to have 20% of their income uh, units income restricted. They also offer a little 9,000 square feet of commercial, which is a little bit different than Connect. Um, Connect did not have that requirement based on the street they were on. Um, Ember is currently on our Promenade Street, which is 198th Street. And this is where we envision kind of our main street redevelopment since Linwood doesn't have a true main street. Um, I told you I would talk about the stalls per unit again. Um, Ember actually has 0.63 stalls per unit, um, which is really interesting as we're seeing more developments come through where they're not offering one-to-one -one stalls per unit. Um, so they see the value of utilizing public transit, the light rail, and the bus services in the area where not they believe that not everybody essentially will need a parking space in their complex. Um, Ember Apartments also just recently won a PSRC Vision Award uh, for, I believe it was on the ground award, and it's just showing how they utilize uh, the city's plans and visions of City Center and Alderwood um, to show real life examples of how housing projects can be successful. 
Another project that is currently under construction, um, they will be opening, I believe, uh, early 2025 is Coe's on Alderwood Mall Boulevard uh, with 199 units. Uh, they are also utilizing the MFTE program with 20% of their units income restricted. Uh, this apartment complex is marketed as workforce housing. So although they are only required to have the 20% um, income restricted at the levels that are mandated by the MFTE program, all of their units will be affordable. I believe they try to target closer to the 60% um, area median income for their rental rates. And they also have utilized uh, almost the 0.5 stalls per unit. So half the amount of stalls per unit will be offered here. And they are just across the street from the light rail station. Um, so really focusing on that transit oriented use uh, for these um, residents. And then lastly, we have Enzo De uh, Apartments, which is another apartment that is just breaking ground. Uh, they have 318 units. They are also on our main street, our promenade street on 198th, um, and they are just across the street from Ember Apartments. They will also have around 4,000 square feet of commercial space, and they have also utilized our MFTE program, um, and they are utilizing our eight-year program, which does not require um, any affordable income requirements, uh, but they still get that break for eight years, and they just started construction this past August, um, and they just were, they, I believe, cleared up the site just recently, and I believe they'll try to be open the next year or two. Now, I talked a lot about of our private investments with all of our multifamily and mixed use developments that are coming in Linwood, but I also want to highlight some of the um, projects that the city is focusing on. Um, this presentation is focusing on planning for people and amenities in transit oriented development and some of the projects that the city is working on is to really bring the city and city center together. So one of the projects that our public works department is working on is our 42nd Avenue West Street project and uh, we put the title stitching together city center. As you can see in the map, um, we have a very big super blocks in Linwood, and we're hoping with the 42nd Avenue West project, which was identified in our transportation plan, is to break up these super blocks and be more of a grid system for more walkability. Um, the city of Linwood desires to create a vibrant and dynamic city center, uh, which will provide residents and visitors alike with new opportunities to live, work, shop, and play. So uh, more than a decade of planning has identified numerous goals and needs for the city center, including creating a finer street grid that supports new development um, and redevelopment and improves walkability. So to achieve this goal, the 42nd Avenue West project between 194th and 200th Street was identified as a primary roadway corridor, uh, which is right in the heart of city center, which will provide additional access and connectivity to future high-rise development and multimodal transportation. Uh, the future street will also provide access uh, to the future um, Town Square Park, uh, which I will talk about briefly in the next couple of slides and our future promenade street along uh, 198th, which I previously mentioned where Ember and Enzo is currently being developed. Uh, the 42nd Avenue West project will also add on-street parking, which we don't really have any in Linwood. Uh, we'll incorporate wider sidewalks and obviously uh, break up the existing super blocks. Uh, another project that the city is working on is the 44th Avenue West underpass bicycle and pedestrian improvement project. Um, as you can see in the top right photo, this is a state of the I-5 underpass as we enter city center. It's very dark. It's very damp. It's not a pleasant pedestrian experience. And for many, this is the only way that people can get to city center um, the, or the light rail station or access the inner urban trail. So this project will provide a, a shared use path that will connect to the inner urban and the city center transit station uh, to South Snohomish County. And it will take the existing I-5 um, underpass and some of the improvements that we're looking to make is um, ad adding lighting, adding wider sidewalks, adding some artistic elements, as you can see, um, adding some wayfinding, landscaping, and a better access to the inner urban and Linwood City Center Station. 
Lastly, we have our Town Square Park. Um, so while our Parks Department has over 17 parks and over 14 miles of trails, we do not have a single park in City Center. So Town Square Park will be the first park in City Center. And this park was identified and ranked as the highest pedestrian priority in the Lin Linwood City Center's Parks Master Plan, which is identified back in 2007 and then again updated in 2018. As I previously mentioned, the 42nd Avenue Street project was also ranked uh, one of the highest in the transportation category in that study. Uh, this site was that was selected is along 198th, our promenade street um, next to Ember and Enzo, and it's about 1.67 acres and is currently the site of a the Goodwill property. Uh, they do have about an eight year lease left on site, so we probably won't see any redevelopment immediately in the next couple of years, um, but that's still giving the city time to work through the design and concepts of the park. Additionally, with the location of this park along 198th, uh, that street is designed to provide extra emphasis on the pedestrian experience along the promenade and the heart of city center. This street should also um, be able to accommodate temporary traffic closures for uh, special events, street fairs, festivals, um, being able to function as both a street and a public space with amenities to support it. Um, 198th is also intended to attract and support investments and redevelopment. And as we've seen with Ember and Enzo along 198th, uh, we've been getting a lot of interest from other uh, property owners and developers about what their redevelopment opportunities are um, in this area of city center. Um, so this is just a very high level concept, a preliminary concept of what they would envision for Town Square Park. And as a reminder, this also ties back into 42nd um, Avenue as well. And I thought some interesting quotes, I pulled uh, the urban out and did a study in 2020 in Linwood. And there are some great quotes that were identified in this study. Um, so I'm just going to read a few because I think it really emphasizes the importance of parks and public spaces in um, urban areas. Um, so one of the quotes were, if Linwood provides desirable amenities, investors will flock to city center. Without the amenities, investors will go where costs are similar, but rewards are greater. Another great quote uh, regarding parks where parks are really the center of communities and bring so many benefits to the places that we live, work, and play. They are vital institutions for community connection, health, equity, and inclusion, environmental sustainability, and equitable economic development. Um, so the Town Square Park redevelopment is one of the high priorities for in both our economic development team and our parks team. And we're just excited to see how uh, the development will play out over the next couple of years. And lastly, we have uh, the Public Facilities District um, in Linwood, uh, better known as the district. Uh, they are um, also in city center and they are currently beginning their steps to reimagine the future of their site. Uh, the district currently owns 13 acres in city center and it also houses the Linwood Event Center that they operate and several retail storefronts. So over the next few years, they are exploring what the site could look like in the future and how it can best serve the community and how it can best support the existing event center. The city has been actively meeting with the Public Facilities District and their team um, to discuss design opportunities and redevelopment opportunities. So some of the design concepts um, that are being thrown around are uh, doubling the size of the event center, um, adding additional residential, adding mixed use, adding office, hotel, retail, um, and really creating a space where people can come and gather. Uh, I think the example that they typically use is uh, University um, Village is also exactly, I believe, 13 acres as well. So if you can invest in envision something like that, uh, but for the city of Linwood, um, that is currently what their goal is in their redevelopment um, opportunities. Also in the bottom right photo, you can see the Linwood Heart um, just right at the entrance of the event center. Uh, this was a art installation that was installed back in 2022 from the city and the art piece is called Love Your New Neighbor. And this is a very visible um, entrance into city center and Linwood right off of I-5 and 405 and was done by a local artist. And I believe the colors that are wrapping the heart represents a traditional Korean wrapping cloth. And the mayor said that this 
um, symbol of this art piece is a symbol of love and inclusiveness in the city. I know we recently hosted a PSRC for a retreat at the event center and um, like that event and many other groups that are visiting Linwood, uh, this art piece is definitely a popular spot in city center and has really tied in um, what city center is st stands for and what it could look like with additional redevelopment. And with that, I am happy to t have any questions. Sarah, that was great. Uh, we're really excited about everything that's happening in Linwood. Um, I'm not currently seeing any questions here, but just a reminder to folks, uh, please use the Q&A. We'll also have time for questions at the end. Um, so without seeing any questions at the moment, I think we could maybe pass to our next presenter, but I really appreciate that, Sarah. Um, and Anna, so are you going to talk a little bit more about planning for arts and culture? Thanks, Liz, and thanks for having me here. Um, I think Sarah needs to stop sharing her screen and then I'll bring my slides up. Thanks. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Anna Sengupta. I'm the Director of Arts and Culture at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, which, um, as Liz mentioned, is the, Met uh, the regional planning agency for Metro Boston. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, when this department was launched in 2017, one of the first things that I got to do was organize what we called a learning journey to go to Seattle and King County and learn from the work at the Seattle Department of Arts and Culture and uh, for Culture. And we also got to talk to a few planners at um, the Puget Sound Regional Council as well. So very inspiring and, and really helped kick off a lot of um, imagining and thinking about what would be possible in Massachusetts. Um, so I'm here today to talk about the um, Arts and Planning Toolkit, which was a project of MAPC um, to kind of document resources and um, tools that planners can use to integrate arts and culture into the work of planning for people and amenities um, in the communities where they work. And um, just to start off, I wanna say that our department was actually a project to implement the, um, the toolkit. And so a lot of the things that are on the toolkit really are examples of the kinds of work that we're doing in the department today. Um, and we've also sort of tried to expand outward from where we began um, to include many more things. So the Metropolitan Area Planning Council is one of 13 regional planning agencies in Massachusetts. Um, we serve the 101 cities and towns that make up what we consider the Metro Boston region. We're a sister agency to the Metro Boston MPO. Um, and we're home to almost half of the Commonwealth's population and almost two thirds of its jobs. Um, so we have a lot of communities that we're trying to serve that have very different characteristics from each other and very different needs. And I think one of the things that's been really interesting in launching the arts and culture practice is to understand that um, we actually work in a context where we don't have a, we don't have counties and we don't have um, a state percent for art program. And so there isn't a dedicated funding stream that can bring public art and amenities into um, publicly funded projects like there is in um, Washington state. So that is a different context that we're working in. And we're really thinking about not just well, how do you fund arts and culture work, which is an important question, but also what are the other ways that planners can think about bringing arts and culture into their projects and shifting planning to be really thinking about how it can allow arts and culture to thrive um, I actually joined MAPC in 2017 with the launch of the department and assumed leadership in 2021 from our founding director, Jen Erickson, who was the original author of this uh, arts and planning toolkit. Um, and, you know, we've seen demand across our entire region for our services. So it's really not just like the, the core urban areas that want to um, integrate arts and culture planning into their work. They're, it's kind of all over and each community has its own challenges that, it's fa that they're facing. Um, and then I think it's important to know that the context that we're in at MAPC is that MAPC is a regional planning agency since 2008 with the Metro Future um, Regional Plan has really expanded to have a lot of more innovative practice areas. And so we're actually a department that was launched 
at a point when there are already really interesting practice areas in clean energy, in public health, um, community engagement. We have sort of both in our research or data services team, we have a research team as well as a digital services team. Um, we have a municipal collaboration department that has um, emergency preparedness work that it's doing and really focuses on municipal collaboration. And that's all kind of alongside the traditional environmental land use transportation planning work that we also do and, and try to continue to innovate in that as well. And at this point, our team, it consists, we have four staff and we have we're hiring for two positions, but we're really organizing our practice around arts and culture planning and policy. And then we have a regional humanities specialist, Lindsay Randall, who's leading a history, heritage and humanities practice. And then the third area is sort of creative placemaking and working with artists and bringing artists into the kinds of projects that we do. And that's currently led by Archana Menon, our arts and culture fellow. So what we do and what it means to implement this toolkit is that we work with our municipal staff, we work with our sub-regional tables, arts and culture stakeholders and others to support cultural planning, creative placemaking, public art and policy making at the local level and at the state level to ensure that arts and culture can thrive. And we really do advocate on issues at the state level and in collaboration with other regional planning agencies and statewide partners like the Massachusetts Cultural Council and Mass Creative, the arts advocacy organization to try to um, push the state to be developing policies and implementing policies that allow for arts and culture to thrive, including trying to get percent for our task. Um, and we do this work because we really see arts, culture, and creativity as essential to like the human experience and as such essential to healthy, resilient, vibrant communities. Um, the challenges that we're facing as planners today require creativity and changes to sort of how we understand what might be possible in order for us to imagine a more equitable, a more resilient, a more connected future. And, you know, government really needs to ensure that creative and cultural paths are available and equitable for, all, for everybody um, and provide opportunities for the arts and culture sector to engage in planning efforts. So it's really exciting to see the previous presentation where you have the night market and the public art kind of activating the transit station and thinking about how to bring artists and creativity into activating um, the spaces and places in our communities. And I guess the only thing I would add to that is you have to make sure that artists can continue to live there. And that when you're thinking about like commercial displacement, we're also seeing a lot of cultural displacement happening in communities in the Metro Boston region and trying to think about what are the strategies that can be used to um, prevent that. So kind of getting back to that human component, like arts and culture really is this dynamic manifestation of human diversity, activity and expression. It strengthens and amplifies human and physical assets in place. And it really, for that reason, is an essential competency and practice for planners, even though it hasn't historically been part of planning education or um, kind of planning practice. And there's a long history for why that is that we won't get into today, but um, I think we're excited to be part of that, a, ch a change and a shift um, in the planning world. So to define what we mean when we talk about arts and culture is like something we try not to do too much because someone always gets upset. It doesn't totally work. You know, art is, and culture are very porous in their edges. They blend into each other. They blend into many other things. Um, when is a bench art and when is a bench a bench is a question that comes up in our practice. Here we'll sort of define art as this expression of human creative skill and imagination that's generating works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power. And that culture encompasses the customs, art, social institutions, and other manifestations of human intellectual achievements of a particular nation, people, or social group. And it can also refer to the attitudes, behaviors, and norms that are characteristic of a place as influenced by the people who live, work, and pass through a place. And you see that both of those really connect strongly to the people and what it means to be a person um, is very tied into what arts and culture actually is.
So the fundamental question around creating and maintaining this arts and planning toolkit is, you know, what are the kinds of resources that planning and community development departments need in order to understand how they can engage with arts, culture, and creativity? So the toolkit does three things. It provides a, a sort of 101 education on the arts and culture sector um, and the impact that arts and culture has on places, not just through economic development, but um, creating healthy and resilient communities and sort of the just introduction to the diversity of ways that arts, culture, and creativity can be engaged within planning processes and practices. And a big part of the toolkit, the second piece of it is case studies to really show what this looks like in practice. It isn't new, it's being done. It's been done for a while um, and often by folks who are outside of the planning field um, and community development field, but it's done by, by artists themselves Folks who are in the nonprofit sector, we have um, a number of community development corporations who have a long history of integrating arts and culture into the work that they do. Um, and then this also provides details on funding. And I would say, certainly now, it has a lot of links to additional resources because we are not the only entity at this point that has compiled information into singular places to think about how to do this work and how to do it well. So we try to make sure that we're always linking to, back to work other folks are doing that we think is really um, useful and impactful. So the toolkit in its first version was launched in 2015. Its primary author was Jen Erickson, who secured funding for this work. Um, and her process for developing the original content was to convene a working group of over 12 advisors from some of the really important arts and culture uh, institutions and also kind of economic development and planning um, entities, including the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the New England Foundation for the Arts, the Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development, as well as consulting with um, experts from the National Endowment from the Arts, from um, Americans for the Arts and for Art Place America, who are all really similarly thinking about this question of how do we help planners and community development practitioners and artists be more effective at bringing together the idea of arts culture in place. Um, it, the case studies, the original set of case studies was compiled through over 25 recorded interviews with the folks who were doing the work, um, municipal staff, planners, developers, and artists. Um, they're organized with very um, consistent sections talking about what the case study is, where it happened, who was involved, what were the successes that came out of it, and what were the takeaways. And then it's all kind of organized in, under this framework of strategies that then link back to the case study. So you always know what you're, what is gonna help you better understand how each strategy, look, what it looks like when it's being implemented. Um, so, that was how it started. And then, you know, as I mentioned, the department itself was launched as an experiment in implementing the toolkit. And so after a few years of the department being active in this space, we actually revamped the toolkit and simplified the menu um, and added more of the work that we have been doing in Metro Boston. So what you'll see today when you go to the toolkit is you have a homepage that introduces the whole concept of it and tells you about all the people who have contributed content and ideas and, um, and advice. And then you have tools and approaches and you have case studies. And I'm just gonna walk through each of those pieces. So you can get a sense for how the toolkit is organized and how you can navigate to find the kinds of things that you might be interested in using. So tools and approaches is a landing page that helps you see a whole spectrum of different strategies and practices that you could get more information about, better understand, and try to think about how you might bring them into the work that you're doing. And we organize these in three categories, practices that are really focused on the thing that you're doing, place, which is practices that are really grounded in particular places and um, 
or facilities or something on the ground and then people, which is more about the engagement elements of the work. And so when you look under practices, you see things like cultural planning, which is like a staple of the work that we do. And we find that that's a really important uh, practice to link place and people and government into developing a shared vision and shared priorities, all the good things that planning does with arts and culture at the center, because many of our plans don't really take into account how the arts and culture sector might be impacted by or could be integrated into um, the other priorities of the municipality. And that includes more specific practices like asset mapping, who is there, what is there, where are things happening, what do we need to know, um, the creative economy, which is can be a mix of engagement and data data analysis. Um, we use the New England Foundation for the Arts's um, definition of the creative economy to pull down data on the economic um, production of arts and creative enterprises. There's also community development work that is about kind of improving life through arts and culture. And then of course, funding, the funding practices that happen at the local level, at the state level, regional and um, through foundations. And then we also include a glossary of terms because we find that a lot of the work of bringing arts and culture into planning is the work of translating between different sort of professional languages around what this work is and what it means. Um, under place, you'll see things that are more place-based. So cultural districts, um, cultural district planning is uh, another really important part of the work that we do. And it allows us to get much more specific into the integration of businesses and economic development, housing, um, cultural programming, cultural arts and culture anchor institutions, and how everything can work together to create really vibrant, meaningful, um, culturally resonant places and spaces in our communities. Cultural facilities is an area of like growing uh, urgency for us because we have a real art uh, cultural space crisis in Massachusetts where artists are being displaced from Boston, Cambridge and Somerville and are struggling to find places that they can afford to do their work. Public art is another element um, of the work, zoning, and how that actually shapes what can happen in terms of what arts and culture uses are allowed or encouraged um, in our communities. Uh, percent for art is sort of a corollary to the public art piece and then creative placemaking and demonstrating how you can activate the public realm through um, engaging artists in community development projects is uh, the last piece of the place category. And then under people, we talk about creative community engagement socially engaged art practices, cultural council. So like the structures that are in place that um, bring people together to think about arts and culture and what currently exists and what is um, what can be amplified. Artist residencies. So bringing um, artists into municipal government through a residency program is something that is increasingly of interest. And then um, we've also used the photo voice methodology in a number of our projects as a way to bring arts and culture together with our um, sort of community-based engagement and also research into the under, to understand um, what is meaningful about places. And then the case study section focuses, is now kind of labeled by case studies that are in Massachusetts because this was primarily oriented to a Massachusetts audience when it was created. Um, but we also have case studies that are national, um, uh, those that are across New England and across the US. And we've labeled any of the projects that are in here that were projects we worked on with our little MAPC logo. So you can get a sense for like, what are things that we just think are really cool that are out there we think you should know about and illustrative of what we'd like to see happen and what are, what are the things that we've actually worked on. And so these are organized around cultural planning, creative placemaking and public arts and culture. And these are sort of three examples of projects that we've done. Boston's Latin Quarter Cultural District Plan, the or Cultural Plan, the Malden River Creative Placemaking Project, and the Watertown Public Arts Master Plan. Um, and I will say one of the things that has been really impactful about this work is seeing the um, things like the Malden River Creative Placemaking Project, which created community events 
worked with local artists, worked with local cultural organizations to bring people together, trained um, cultural ambassadors in Malden on the zoning concepts that were that were impacting the Malden River and development along that river, and then brought the public along and educated them as well about the vision for the river and the way that zoning impacted that vision. And after this project was completed, the recommendations around how to um, increase the amount of space along the river for cultural use and public use um, were passed by the Malden City Council. And there was a lot of um, kind of public support for something that otherwise had been fairly invisible and not well understood by the public. So really seeing the impact of creative placemaking as a way to do um, more impactful planning work that leads to implementation pretty quickly was um, a huge lesson for me from that project. And then in addition to some of all of the work that's in the toolkit, I did just wanna to touch on some of the other things that we're doing to implement the toolkit at MAPC. So as I said, that education piece is a really important element of the toolkit work. And we continue to do education outside the toolkit as well through trainings and workshops. We run a Making It Public for Municipalities program that's inspired and sort of riffs off of the Forecast Public Art, uh, Making It Public program for arts administrators, but is specific to the very, very specific procurement context of Massachusetts and teaches municipalities how they can commission works of art uh, in a way that's compliant with our Mass General Law Chapter 30B. Um, and then we also have been doing a lot of work on arts and cultural data and policy. And this image is for our art space risk assessment that we did in Somerville, where we mapped all of the um, creative and cultural spaces in the city of Somerville and uh, created a heat map of the exposure to development pressure. So the darkest green color are parcels that buildings that have the lowest exposure to development pressure and the red is those that have the highest exposure to development pressure. And it was a very interesting project because we found that we were losing spaces even when they were at the lowest level of exposure to development pressure and that art spaces really are quite vulnerable to any development pressure that's coming in, um, but also found that over 2 million square foot of building square footage was um, at that highest, the high and highest risk categories. Um, which was very disturbing because we didn't really have a plan for how to address that. Um, and we're continuing to do work uh, in response to that finding um, today. And the other piece of this I wanted to just mention was that um, Jen Erickson, in addition to creating this toolkit, also launched the Arts and Planning Interest Group at the American Planning Association. And we were uh, recognized as a division in 2021. And we exist to transform the planning profession through arts and culture and welcome any of you who are interested in learning more to come and find us and um, participate. We have socials at all of the art uh, APA conferences that brings artists and planners together. And then we also have a newsletter that features um, many of the same kinds of content, but sort of up to date and um, interesting projects that are happening at the intersection of arts and culture and planning. And here are all the ways that you can continue to learn more and connect. And I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Great, thank you so much. It's um, really inspiring work, I think. Um, we've got uh, one question that came in. Um, the value of art is subjective. How do you evaluate artists' work during the decision-making process? Who does make the final decision? Thanks for that question. Um, the way that we set up our or recommend that you set up a selection process is that you first go through um, an engagement process of some kind before you even release a call for art, where you have an understanding of what are the values that this are gonna underlie the project. That is the purpose of why you're doing it. What are the goals? And then you integrate, you create um, review criteria that align with those values and those goals to ensure that you are selecting an artist based on criteria that are linked to what you were trying to accomplish through the project. And then we have um, <clears throat> uh, I can I mean, I could share with you some of the rubrics if you're more interested, but we basically 
would recommend that you train your selection panel on the criteria in an information session ahead of time, and then um, have a sort of clear scoring rubric that you bring into the decision-making process and then um, have a defensible selection that comes out of that process. And it is somewhat subjective because some of the elements that you're looking for are subjective, but you want to make sure that you are being clear in how you are describing what you're trying to do so that it has a um, something to tie back to so that whoever's reviewing those proposals um, understands what it is that they're reviewing it for. And it's not just, this is my favorite artist. <laughs> and I want them to get the job. Um, so that is, that's how we handle that. Great. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment, but please feel free to keep using the Q&A box. Um, but I want to thank you so much. And I think we'll pass the uh, baton to Katie. Hi, everybody. Um, let me share my screen quickly. All right. Thanks for having me today. Um, my name is Katie Ricuto, and I work for the U District Partnership. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about how we as a community based organization do um, placemaking and take advantage of some of the massive transit oriented development that is uh, taking place in the U District uh, in Seattle. So just a little bit about our organization for those who don't know us. Um, the U District Partnership is a place management organization. We are a nonprofit organization that is selected by uh, the city of Seattle to manage the U District Business Improvement Area. Um, we were established in 2015, uh, but prior to that, uh, we were essentially the Greater U District Chamber of Commerce for 100 years. We provide a number of programs that are funded um, through our uh, rate paying property owners, uh, as well as through grants and other funding that we receive um, from the city and from other organizations and grant programs. That includes advocacy and economic development, um, placemaking and public realm work, marketing and events, cleaning and safety, and homeless outreach. This is the U District Partnerships uh, service area, the uh, map on the right hand side of the screen. Um, we define our service area as everywhere east of Interstate 5, um, west of 25th, so pretty much west of University Village. We do not include University Village shopping area in our boundary. Um, south of Ravenna Boulevard and then north of the Ship Canal. So the University of Washington is um, a really important and interesting relationship uh, for us. We do not provide a lot of services on campus, but the University of Washington is a voluntary ratepayer for our organization. So they do provide funding for the work that we do. Um, we have University of Washington um, staff members on our board of directors, and we also work closely with them um, on a number of the programs that we have in the U District. The U District Business Improvement Area, I'll just say, is a, a specifically a smaller um, section of this map where we provide additional services. But because we're a nonprofit, um, we say that our service area is broadly the U District. Um, I wanted to provide you with a little bit of context of the U District and where we are today. It's considered one of the fastest growing neighborhoods in Seattle. Um, and thanks to the upzone in 2017, it's one of Seattle or the Puget Sound area's three downtowns, in addition to Bellevue and downtown Seattle. And it's considered a cultural, commercial, and residential hub for North Seattle. It's also the um, one of a, just a handful of regional centers um, identified in um, you know, Seattle's comprehensive planning process. And um, the University District, uh, as I said, is adjacent to the University of Washington. UW is home to 48,000 students, 10,000 of which live in UW housing, either on campus or um, right off campus in the neighborhood, 3,000 in Greek housing, and then another 35,000 students that live off, off campus, either in the U District or in other, uh, in other areas. And then, um, 
UW has over 17,000 staff and over 8,000 faculty members that are in the neighborhood um, regularly or daily. And the neighborhood has 36,000 total residents. So this information is important just to provide you context with um, the size of our neighborhood, the density of, of the area, and how much it is growing and will continue to grow. And a lot of that growth is due to some significant momentum in the U District in the past uh, nine to 10 years. So as I said, our business improvement area expanded in 2015 so that we could provide additional services to the neighborhood through additional income. Um, and then in 2017, um, we had a massive shift in the neighborhood when it was rezoned. I'll show you a map of our zoning in a minute, but essentially we went from a neighborhood of mostly, um, you know, 75 foot or seven story height limits to between 240 and 320, uh, 320 feet in our core area. So we had a really significant um, change, which if you ever, if you drive over the Ship Canal Bridge going north or south, you can see a lot of our towers that have gone up in the past handful of years. In 2019, the University of Washington's master plan um, was adopted, and that's going to guide growth of the university's um, uh, space on and directly off campus for the next 10 years. Um, we had to go through a renewal process for our business improvement area in 2020, which again grew our revenue and our service area. And then between when the pandemic happened, um, we obviously lost such a significant amount of our residents but um, and our, our people that came to work here, but um, we still had a lot of building growth happening. And then within a year and a half, UW returned to campus. And then um, the same time UW returned to campus, the U District Station opened. So while all of this work was going on, uh, Sound Transit's U District Station as part of the uh, Northgate Link Extension was under construction. And when that station opened, um, it was a massive uh, change for our neighborhood, both in all of the building that was taking place around it and also in the ways that people accessed our neighborhood. This is just a map to show you our zoning. So if you look at this like big white line down the middle, that is Interstate 5. To the left of that is the Wallingford neighborhood. So you can see that's pretty low rise um, heights there. And then to the right of that is all the U District. And I'll just point you to the center section, which is like a deep red color. Um, and that is where the majority of our zoning changed from the rezone um to 240 to 320 feet and that's why you'll see a spine of some pretty significant towers being built along Brooklyn and 12th Avenue um significantly I will uh I will add that the AV um, University Way our main street if you've been to the U district you've probably been there it's our commercial core the zoning for that street did not change um so that still retains buildings that are mostly just a couple stories tall. Um, we do not have a historic designation for the street, but it was left out of the zoning changes um, as a response to um, community conversations around what the future of the street will look like. Um, this is just, uh, I wanted to give you a visual of what some of this unprecedented investment looks like. Um, and again, like a lot of this is because we got this light rail station and we have, um, we are growing in density around it. So you'll see here a visual of the U District from above. If you look kind of to the top left of your screen, you'll see UW Tower, um, tiny little building there, and then just one tall building north of that, which is the M. That was the first tower completed. This picture was from 2019. Um, and then this is what the neighborhood could look like in the future if all of the buildings that are planned are built. This actually, this rendering was from 2019. So there's even more that have been proposed and, and a lot more that have come to completion. The red is all private um, development that has been proposed and the purple is potential University of Washington redevelopment sites. You'll see the purple one that's a little bit uh, north of everything else. That's the U District Station building, um, which is almost completed now. And I will uh, talk a little bit more about that later. This is just another view of what it could look like if you're kind of hovering above the university bridge or if you're uh, coming over the Ship Canal Bridge. So it's really, really significant. We're absorbing such a huge amount of density. And as uh, as a neighborhood-based organization, we are working to figure out how to 
active provide place making and activation for all of these new residents. This is just a handful of the buildings that um, have been built or are planned. So as you can see, they're really tall, really dense. The majority of them are um, housing um, focused on students. So, you know, multi-bed scenarios where there's like five beds and they share a common space and um, and like a kitchen. But there are a few, a handful of commercial buildings being built or planned. There's a hotel and there's some um, residential that is not necessarily geared towards students. And just recently, a couple affordable housing projects have been announced. Um, all of this amounts to over 20 new towers proposed in the neighborhood. That's almost 5 million square feet of residential that will be built at some point. Um, and um, more than 7,000 new residents that could be living in the neighborhood in the next decade. Um, it's over a million square feet of office space that's planned, um, and then over 100,000 square feet of ground floor retail. Um, a lot of this will be served by the U District Light Rail Station, which um, as of right now carries up to 10,000 daily riders. Um, and then the UW campus redevelopment, I'm not really going to talk about that, but that's a significant portion of um, the southern part of the U District, south of, south of Campus Parkway, that um, will connect to the neighborhood in the future and will drive a significant amount of people moving north and south through the neighborhood. So how is the U District responding to all of this growth from a placemaking and activation perspective? Um, I think one of the first things that I wanted to focus on that we have done is um, create placemaking around, place around Northeast 43rd Street. So this is a view of our seating plaza from above. Northeast 43rd Street connects directly to the U District Station, between U District Station and uh, the University of Washington campus. The street on the the that's going up and down on the left hand side of this um, image is the Ave, so uh, you can see that it kind of Forty Third Street kind of runs through the core of the neighborhood, and the Seattle Department of Transportation and uh, Sound Transit uh, redeveloped this street in anticipation of the station opening. Um, S Dot's work included um, widening the sidewalks significantly. Um, and, you know, they went from like four to six foot sidewalks to like four, 10 to 14 feet, uh, even more. And that was really great because it allowed us as an organization to place some outdoor seating here and some umbrellas. This project actually came out of a response to the pandemic. Um, the street, when the pandemic hit, the station was not open yet and the street was not completed. Um, but uh, the city of Seattle in order to help, uh, you know, neighborhoods and businesses um, re relax some of its permitting guidelines for outdoor seating um, because of the restrictions of having uh, people inside to eat. So we took advantage of that. We worked with area businesses um, to get their support either financially, um, and if they couldn't pay for it, we paid for it ourselves, um, to put picnic tables and umbrellas out here it was meant to be a temporary response to the pandemic, um, but it and and it's public seating, so it's not um, the only part that is restricted to a business is um, outside of Kai's Bistro, right across from the station, because they serve alcohol there. So they have like permitted fencing and an alcohol permit to serve, but the rest of it is public seating. Um, people use it every day of the year. It was so successful that we now, as an organization, uh, maintain it. Uh, 365 days of the year. The umbrellas are out anytime um, it's sunny and we, ex or, you know, relatively nice out and not pouring and we expect people to be there. Um, in addition, we also maintain the planter beds here. So uh, while these were not intended to be maintained by the neighborhood organization, we found that um, as a, they were a really big asset to the neighborhood. And so as a community organization, uh, we decided to spend our funding to maintain those planter beds so they uh, create a welcoming environment for people. This is just another view of uh, the plaza and what it can look like on a busy day. Um, even though this street is a bus only street to allow Metro buses to access the station, we have a really good working relationship with the city and with King County Metro and we close the street 
um, annually for a handful of our major events to allow people more opportunity to um, walk around, walk from the station to the core of our neighborhood and to attend our events. This has been a huge win for us um, and for our neighborhood. It would be really challenging um, to activate the street with the you know twenty to fifty thousand people we get to some of our major events if we weren't able to close it and we had to pay attention to buses going down the street. So while bus access is really important on those handful of days that we have major events, it's really great that we can work with um, our government and our city officials to close the street. And I just wanted to share some lessons learned from this for anybody who either works for government or works for a community organization that is, you know, thinking about how to do this type of activation or what helps with something like this and making something like this possible. Um, we really found that uh, in order to keep the seating area uh, good for our businesses and our visitors, we needed to provide daily maintenance and safety ambassadors. We have ambassadors that work throughout the neighborhood every day of the year. Um, they're unarmed safety ambassadors that can respond to um, minor incidences and help people that need help. And um, so they are in the area every day. And then we also have cleaning staff that uh, clean the picnic tables every day. They put out the umbrellas and take them in every night um, because we found that you can't leave umbrellas out overnight um, or else some of them walk off. Um, and then uh, we also have uh, weekly maintenance of the, the green space and planter beds along the street. The easier and free city permitting process during the pandemic made this possible. Um, I don't think that we would have been able to do this had it not been for that. And I also, the city has been um, really helpful in maintaining this permit as um, some of the you know regular permitting fees and processes have come back post pandemic. It's really important for us to get buy-in from adjacent businesses. So um, we either did that financially if they wanted to contribute to the picnic tables initially, or we just kind of got their support to put them out there with the understanding that we were going to maintain them. And then since then, we as an organization have just used our own budget to maintain the seating area. Um, like I said, continued support from the city is really important. And then we also did surrounding placemaking. So we put murals up on the alleys adjacent to this. Um, as I said, there is a huge mural that went in on the um, Crossroads building. It's a big orange mural. You can't miss it. Um, we did not pay for that, but we were really supportive of that going in. And then um, we also had a mural that was put on the storefront of Sweet Alchemy Ice Creamery on the corner of 43rd and University Way. The next thing I wanted to talk to you about in terms of um, placemaking around transit-oriented development is the U District Station Park. Um, so U District Station building is a really unique building. As you can see in this picture, it's a building that is being, being built. It's almost completed actually right on top of um, the U District light rail station. Um, it's unique in that the station as it was built was built to have a building on top of it. So they essentially had to engineer the, the station building to um, hold a pretty large building on top. Um, it is uh, being developed by a private developer, but the University of Washington um, owns and leases the air rights to it. So the University of Washington will have a number of floors of um, their employees in this building, um, in addition to a few other floors that have yet to, that you know will be filled by other organizations or companies. Um, as I said, it's right adjacent to where 10 to 12,000 people a day are going to be getting off the light rail. So it's really important um, in its placement in that um, hopefully a lot of employees who are coming to work in this building can get off the light rail and go directly to work. Um, and then it will have 5,000 residents around it. So the it was really important that the ground floor be um, activated and nice for people who are walking around the building and into the building. But very significantly, um, in front of this left-hand side where UW Tower is, there used to be an old IHOP, uh, House of Pancakes, um, and that area was used for staging, for construction, um, but it's also going to be made into a little pocket park as part of the open space um, requirement that the building is meeting. And we, as an organization, really saw this park as an opportunity because the U District lacks so much um, publicly available open space in the core of the neighborhood. We saw it as an opportunity to work with the developers early to design a park 
that um, would meet the needs of the neighborhood, some of the needs of the neighborhood. So we have been having conversations with the developers of this park for several years now, um, and we are really grateful to them for being willing to have those conversations with us and listen to community about what that park could be. Um, some of the things that are going to be included in the park design are usable open space. So um, actually a lot of hard space in the middle that's flat, mostly flat. This The site is pretty significantly sloped, but they made sure that the center part was pretty flat. Um, there's going to be open space for movable seating, um, tables and umbrellas, um, regular activation and activities, and um, even space for potentially a market, uh, markets of some sort, whether that's farmers markets, crafts markets. Um, there is really durable plantings around the outside. So um, natural plantings that can also withstand a pretty harsh urban environment that we have in the U district. It has really good sight lines, which is important because um, it's right outside of a station. It's by an alley. Um, it's a really centrally located park. It's going to have public art. And then we asked them to include um, water and power access at the amount that we needed in case we or other organizations wanted to do um, activities in this park moving forward. What we found around the station area is that we can host events, but there's not a lot of opportunities to hook up to power or water. And so the fact that the developers were willing to put that in for us is really makes a big difference. And then it's going to have some nice lighting um, to keep it safe and welcoming. Um, at all times. Um, this is just an example of like the initial sketches that the designers were doing with us to look at like how many tents you could get in this. So we had a lot of conversations around like how big should the hardscape area be so that we can accommodate a number of tents that like potentially a farmer's market would actually be willing to host because there's enough space. Um, I should say that initially um, there were conversations around having like immovable seating um, in the center of this park. And I think some of the initial thinking that people were doing was like, how do we um, make it so that people come here but don't stay here for super long periods of time? And I think that um, thanks to some really great conversations that we had, we decided that it was better to create a really open environment so that there can be multiple activities and then also space for like an organization like the U District Partnership to potentially help manage um, things like outdoor seating that can be taken in and out uh, at the beginning and end of the day or other activations that can take place regularly. This is just an example of like some of the plantings that were planned and a potential sculpture. So um, just part of the process and you'll see like the main plaza space in the middle and then there's like a, a higher grade that people kind of walk into it. Um, so it's not necessarily a bowl, but it's a little bit sunken and it creates like a really uh, comfortable, cozy park feeling. These are just some ideas that we have of what could be done in the space. So like lots of people, lots of tents, lots of seating. Um, color schemes to match. We we intentionally matched our picnic tables on 43rd to the exact color of the light rail station. It's called Bora Bora Shore for anybody who's interested. Um, it's this blue color. So, uh, sorry. So we're really thinking about like, how can we carry that on from 43rd Street into this park and make it seem like one really welcoming and cohesive space. <clears throat> Um, so just some of the lessons learned for us as a neighborhood organization and for anybody thinking about this work, um, it's really important to engage with developers early. We are lucky as an organization that we have um, a staff member, myself, that can have these conversations um, because that really helped us kind of direct the conversation to work on a park that um, will be usable by not just our organization, but a lot of people in the community. So we really spoke up for what we thought um, some of the community needs were, and we had a great team of designers that we were working with that were willing to hear what we had to say. Um, we worked on a design to bring people in and not necessarily just keep people out. And then we also are working on a plan for year-round activation. The park is not open yet. Um, it's almost done. Uh, it should be open. I don't know exactly when, but like it's, it's planted. And uh, I think they're just waiting on some of the final things for the building across the street before they open the park. But it's going to be open really soon, and we're really excited about it, especially for next year when um, the weather gets nice again and we can do more activities in the park. The last thing I wanted to share that we do in terms of placemaking and activation is um, our year-round series of events that we put on. We as a neighborhood organization find that um, 
events are really great ways to bring people into neighborhoods and also take advantage of some of the um, new residents that are going to be living in all these new buildings, but then also some of the like new street design that we have that makes it easier for us to host these events. Um, so our four major events are the Cherry Blossom Festival, which takes place in March and April when the University of Washington's Cherry Blossoms Bloom. Boba Fest, because we have, we think, the largest number of bubble tea um, cafes in Seattle. I think we have like over 30 or something like that and more open all the time. Um, so we wanted to have a, a little festival that brings people into the neighborhood uh, to um, go to some of those places and try out bubble tea if they haven't. Um, the U District Street Fair, which is the longest running street fair in the United States, um, it shuts down over a mile of city streets in the U District. Last year, we had over 350 vendors. It was our largest street fair ever. Um, and it continues from it, when it started in 1972 to now. It's every third weekend in May, and it kicks off the summer event season. And then the U District Chowdown, um, which actually started as the U District Station Opening Festival, which was a huge festival we threw um, in celebration of the light rail station opening in 2021. We also did a, a $3 food walk um, to bring people not just to the neighborhood for the station opening, but also to visit our local um, restaurants. And we do it in conjunction with the students coming back to um, introduce potentially new students on campus or returning students to some of our restaurants um, to get the business to the restaurants, but then also to have students try things at a reduced cost. Um, that has turned into the U District Chowdown. It's now a $5 food walk, um, thanks inflation. Um, but we still think it's a really good way to uh, bring people to our neighborhood and introduce everyone to all of the awesome food and business that we have. Um, it's actually tomorrow, in case anybody's interested in going. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so the Chowdown is tomorrow, and we're really excited to have it um, now for the fourth year. Um, some lessons learned from these events is it's really important to have them be seasonal. We time them with things that we think are important to our neighborhood. So whether that's the students coming back in the fall, cherry blossoms when there's tens of thousands of people visiting campus, um, Boba Fest, we're going to be, uh, we used to have it in the spring and now we're going to be having it in the summer to bring people to the neighborhood um, in the times that are slower for our businesses. And then street fair in May has it's always been then. So it's, you know, our way to say we're kicking off the summer. Um, our events are all ages, but they're focused on our biggest audiences, depending on what it's for. So whether that's students for um, Chowdown or Boba Fest um, or, um, you know, people from everywhere who are interested in the street fair. We always try to drive customers to local businesses, um, especially for the Chowdown Cherry Blossom Festival and Boba Fest. Street Fair does bring in outside vendors, but we have worked on ways to include our small businesses as vendors themselves. We have done a lot of activation centered around the station since it's open. That's where we always put our welcome tent. That's where we always hand out all of our brochures. We sell our merch there. We concentrate um, our tents there um, and vendor tents there. So as soon as people get out of the station, we really take advantage of the streets that are wide around there with the widened sidewalks that we work with the city to close. And then we do a lot of colorful placemaking with like balloons and street murals and other sorts of decorations to make the area around the station, especially, but in the uh, event footprint, really welcoming to people. So that's it. Um, I hope that you learned a little bit about how like a neighborhood based organization takes advantage of some of the um, both like the city and the private development that changes a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, we try to take advantage of that in ways that brings people that does placemaking that creates long term opportunities through parks um, and through some of our, you know, seating in areas where we otherwise we're so such a dense neighborhood that we we wouldn't really have that opportunity. Great. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, we did have one question come in and please feel free to um, keep populating questions. But question was um, that, you know, the U District is one of the cult most culturally diverse neighborhoods in Seattle. So if, could you talk about kind of how you think about cultural, racial, social diversity as part of your programming or activation work? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we, yes, that is true. And um, I think we do a lot of that work through our events and through our business um, engagement and 
recruitment. So we have really worked hard to bring our our um, different businesses, many of which are owned by women, people of color, um, sole proprietors, people whose um, primary language is not English. We've done a lot of work to make connections with them and um, include them in all of our uh, event outreach and engagement and planning. And I think that's been a really good way to like build trust in the neighborhood. Um, I think our events are pretty popular amongst a wide variety of people. Um, and, uh, especially like students, you know, we have a lot of students that are here from, um, they're international students that are here and, um, they really enjoy getting to know our neighborhood through events because it seems like, you know, a comfortable and exciting way to get introduced to the neighborhood rather than just kind of like exploring when you get here by yourself. So, um, that's one way that we do it. Uh, I guess I would just say another way is that we try to keep our, our public spaces and the placemaking that we do um, feeling really like clean and safe and comfortable. And, and the work that we've done on the park as well is figuring out how to make that feel like it can be accessed um, through multiple times a day by anybody who wants to use it, um, keeping our outdoor seating area open to the public and um, you know, not having it. So each business manages a space and it's kind of closed off unless you, um, patronize those businesses is another important way that we um, try to make the space feel inclusive. Great. Thank you. Um, I did have a follow-up question for Annis. If you could talk a little bit more about, uh, you had shown this map of, of uh, exposure to development pressure and sort of our cultural arts and culture space. I'm curious kind of like how you develop that and how you can help, how you identified some of those, uh, that risk. Thanks for that question. Um, I actually probably need to go find a different slideshow where I have the whole chart of all of the things that we took into account, but we worked with our um, data services team who does a lot of the like analytical research work and has done similar things in different contexts, but basically um, they created a, um, a rubric of characteristics of a parcel that we could have data on, which had to do with distance to transit stations, although we ended up having to exclude, I think, distance to bus stations because it was like, it, it, it just muddied the waters because everything was close to that. Um, it Proximity, like the number of building permits that had been pulled in a certain radius around the parcel to um, signify sort of development interest in that area. Um, the amount of like the different differential and FAR that was allowed versus built. So sort of the development potential of the sites was also taken into account as well as like the size of the parcel so that larger parcels had sort of higher exposure to development pressures than smaller parcels. Um, and I can, I, I can try to find the whole rubric, um, but that was, that was put together and it was like, there were a couple of different iterations of it because we had to test which of them actually like made sense and, and showed something meaningful for Somerville, which is a very, um, very, very densely built, primarily residential city that is right next to Boston and has um, the Green Line extension that had, was, had just come through. And so it was not surprising, but you're seeing all of those places that were the like red and orange dots were in close proximity to where there were going to be new um, transit stations. So it's interesting. I think there's probably a lot of, I'm just interested to see that you're doing the commercial displacement where transit is coming in because it is certainly um, an issue that I think overlaps very significantly with um, the impact on arts and culture spaces as well. Yeah, great, thank you so much. Um, well, I don't see any other questions coming in, so I might pass it over to Katie to um, wrap us up. Sure, thanks Liz, and thank you once again to all of our presenters. Um, yeah, learned a lot, a lot of very interesting presentations. So I did just once more want to share about our upcoming webinar. So that was a great transition from Annis, uh, where we will be looking at preventing commercial displacement near transit. That should be taking place on November 1st at 10 a.m. So you can register. 
I also wanted to let you know, once again, a little more information about our AICP credit. So if that is something that you are interested in claiming, please feel free to either search the title of this webinar or you can use the ID number that I have listed here. Um, so you should be able to claim that credit. Finally, we have a quick survey that we will be launching here in just a moment, just a little bit of information about your experience with the webinar today and any ways we can improve. And then there's an optional Title VI survey that you'll have the opportunity to answer when you leave the webinar today as well. So I will go ahead and ask Michaela to launch our final poll just to get a little bit of feedback. And I'll go ahead and say goodbye for now, but we will leave this up um, until 1130. So you have a little bit of time to answer these questions and we hope to see you on November 1st. So thank you.